This will be our eighth installment in the book of Ephesians. We'll be in Ephesians 1, 8. While we all know this, technically we know it, it's good to go over it again, rehearse it in your mind, that edification involves a building process. It's just not that things are said that you like, you know. <laughs> we hope you like them, but yeah. there's a building progress process going on, and the building project is the church. Yeah. Jesus said, I will build my church. Yeah. Well, that meant more than increasing it in numbers, although it is already passed a phenomenal number. I don't know if anyone is able to estimate in the history of Christendom, how many people have been added to Christ? I mean, it's, it's a staggering multitude already, and it's not done yet. But the building project is more than a numeric thing. That is involved because I can't imagine that a great deposit of that's been made in Christ Jesus would be that God would be glorified by five or ten converts. I mean, I. I can't believe this. I don't care what people say if you're the only one Christ has done it anyway and all that. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of talk. That's yeah. all it is. God told people to enlarge the tent and widen the stakes. Oh. He's not glorified by minuscule numbers to make no... It's always a sign of falling away mm -hmm. when there's a small number. Mm -hmm. I'm talking on a global scale. So the building, edification involves building... And the objective is to make the church suitable for God to dwell in it. God doesn't dwell every place. I'm convinced that I would not set myself as a judge as to where this is true and where it's not true. But there's some churches that God never visits. And there are some that he always visits. Maybe some that occasionally he visits, but... The purpose for building up the church isn't just so they'll all be strong. It's so that they'll be suitable, a suitable dwelling place for God. That's the aim. If anyone but the Lord had undertaken this project, it'd have been hopeless. It'd have been hopeless to try and salvage humanity. If anybody but God would have attempted this. It just would have fallen to the ground. It's too, it's too great of a work. To end up with God dwelling in these people, there's not a spot or wrinkle or any such thing in them. That's, that's where this thing is headed. Amen. Amen. So now you know why we're anti-spot and anti-wrinkle. Because yeah. right. when this thing's finished, there isn't going to be any of it. So we want to get ready to get used to it, the, its absence now yeah, as much as possible. To the Lord. To the Lord. So there's not really any use for holiness if you take the Lord out of the picture. That's right. Amen. That's the high priest had this right. holiness to the Lord. Extends so far that even the cooking pots become holy. That's right. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so edification is not an end of itself. It's necessary, but and we stress it. But it's not the. It's just along the way. It's not an, an end of itself. That is, if you, once you've been edified, that's not. You think, well, we've we've finally arrived. That isn't it. Those are not the end, in other words, or the singular objective. They are a divinely appointed means to a determined end, and the end cannot be realized independent of these means. There isn't anybody going to end up in heaven that wasn't edified here. That's the building. That's what's being built. The built here. It's good to see this. This by no means suggests that we're to consider fellowship with Christ that's not an end of itself as inconsequential. Oh, 
We're not suggesting that for a moment. Well, the edification, which is an end, not an end of itself. We're not suggesting that that's like dispensable. We're saying it's all part of a process. It's been in works now for quite a while. The church is being built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's, that's now. If God didn't in the church now, he won't be then. That's the way it is. So that's the purpose. is isn't to get people in the church. It's to get God in the church. That's, that's the purpose. So that God is among you. As uh, Paul painted that scenario, you know, of an unbeliever, a stranger coming in. Everybody starts prophesying. I knew right, right away it wasn't a group like I would come from. Everybody was prophesying, but they weren't just prophesying. God was speaking through them to this, to this stranger or unbeliever. And he's convicted. He fell on his face and said, God is in you of a truth. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. See, so that's, that's the purpose. That's the objective for God to be there as valuable as all these other things are. And in the end, John saw a picture of the end, the grand conclusion. And he said, here's what he said he saw and heard. I heard a voice, <laughs> a great voice. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, look at this, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. See, that's where, that's where it's all ending up. So whatever activity doesn't blend well with that, just get rid of it. If it's something you can't really get rid of, then it fall to, let it fall to the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. It has to be way down there someplace in priorities. Jesus came to get the work underway. He initiated the work, got it underway. Couldn't get underway till sin was taken care of, till sin was gathered together in one place, deposited on Christ, laid upon Christ, and then judged once and for all. Until that was done, the work really wasn't underway. Everything else was just an announcement that a work was going to be done. But the work really wasn't underway yet. Even though these men of faith had faith, God wasn't working in them like he's working in people today. Why? Because the sin hadn't been dealt with. That's why. Jesus said, describing this work getting underway, if a man... Love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode. See, it isn't whether or not once in a while God visits you. I mean, that's nice, but it is, that's not really what we're targeting here. Dwelling, that take up their abode, make their abode, that is, they move in to stay. Why is, that, why is that so? Because the individual stones have to have the same objective that the combined building is. The combined building is that God's going to dwell there. So it begins with God and Christ coming into the person who loves them. That means more than anything else. A person who doesn't love God more than anything else doesn't love God. They just, they're not telling the truth that they say they do. They love God. They keep his command. They can't forget what God said. They remember it. Then God moves into this person, and he's a, each person's like an individual stone, living stone. Yeah. And what's going to take place in the whole takes place in the part in measure. Mm -hmm. See? Each person has a measure. So the building of the church aggregate, not the building of our denomination or something of that sort. Some people's concept of God never gets outside their local assembly. That's, that's pretty much where it's confined. But this, this is a big project we're part of. Amen. The building of the church aggregate 
commences in this world is completed in that one. Because yes, most of the members have moved up higher at this point. Now in this first chapter of Ephesians, Paul is working he's like a spiritual tactician with spiritual expertise. He's showing how we are being individually built up into this habitation. And to do this, he's tracing things back to their cause so we understand it thoroughly. No person can afford to be ignorant of this process that he's talking about. So verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That's quite a statement. He, wherein he, he is abounded toward us aggregate. Not us, us. Us aggregate, all the body. In all wisdom and prudence. The word wherein intrigued me because the different versions that read so different, you got to spend some time on this so you miss the point. Some versions read, which he, that he, whereby he, in which God gave us that grace. Some people leave the word when, wherein, is it completely left out, not even in there. But it is, there is a word for wherein, and it's used here. In the native language, the word translated wherein is a, nom a denominative pronoun. <laughs> well, I know people say, what in the world is a denominative pronoun? That means what he was talking about before, he's going to tell you what it does now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So thing you left off, you talk about grace, so he's wherein grace He's, he's telling now what great what happens in grace wherein, and the word is it's a proper word. Wherein means the environment that environment. I don't know why people left it out, but they did. The sentence is intended to elaborate on the grace of God. He just doesn't mention the grace of God. He elaborates on it. Now, see, I come from a background, an institutional background, where we, we hardly ever mention grace, let alone elaborate on it. But, but here's an elaboration on the grace of God. Some things it does. It represents, uh, it does not represent, grace is not just a divine attitude. I'm afraid some people think it is just a kind of undivine attitude that God knows what you really are, but he looks at you di differently than what you really are. He overlooks who you really are, yeah. what you really are. That's, that's some people's notion of grace. And they've attached this unmerited favor, you know, on it. Even the word doesn't mean unmerited. It's not in the meaning of the word at all. Admittedly, it is. A, we, we acknowledge it's unmerited, but, but that's not what the word grace means. It has to do with God's favor. His favor. And his favor, in other words, God's not going to bless anybody he doesn't like. Yeah, that's right. And God doesn't like everybody. Mm -hmm. If God's not attracted to somebody... He's not going to work a blessing in him. Amen. If he is, he's not going to fail to work a blessing in him. See? Yeah. That's what grace has to do with Noah found grace. What, look what happened? Yeah. He did something. He did something with Noah. See, he worked with him. Grace is, is an environment. Mm -hmm. It's like a great big room that there's a lot of things in it. Grace, we're in. Yes. Talking about that God liking people. Somebody online told me, well, actually, he just didn't like Esau as much. And I said, oh, I replied to him, <laughs> and look what happened. Yeah. 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 We use the word like. It's a, it's a, 
inclined toward it'd be a more of a scriptural idea but the idea is he God just can't smile at everybody just like these pictures of a smiling Jesus they, and I don't know who come up with that but it's a nutcase whoever did because this God does he does have a pleasantness toward those that he approves of but they, but he doesn't approve of everybody doesn't accept everybody. Person raises who doesn't have a humble and contrite spirit, forget it. You're not going to be getting grace. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. But if a person does have a humble and contrite spirit, God's attracted to that kind of a person, see? Or that believes on the Son. Or that walks by faith. That kind of person, grace works in them. That's right. That's exactly right. So grace is an environment in which the work of God is accomplished within us, wherein, or we might say in which, in a more modern English, an abundant work would require an abundant supply of grace. See? Mm -hmm. Yes? We were talking last Lord's Day, yeah. mm. I believe, about um, God resting. Yeah. When it, he, he had accomplished something mm -hmm. it didn't mean he was inactive it just meant he there was a cessation of a continuing adding to or building mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he began to his activities were were within the realm of what he had done and those things that he made during those times operated within those environments he talking about mm, uh, the the prudence and wisdom of God, it's all been supplied through grace to us. This is the work of God, and if men try to operate outside of what God is doing, it's not going to accomplish what, what yeah. God wants. It's not going to it's not going to meet with his purpose. It's going to fall short, in other words. Well we already know what falling short is. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's going to come short of the glory of God if it isn't God working it. And grace is is the operation of God actively in the believer accomplishing His purpose. Amen. Both in us and corporately. And a lot of these thoughts that you started out with, as I was listening to them, they're like, alien thoughts. Mm -hmm. When a person starts thinking, reasoning from themselves, what I want, what God will give me, what mm -hmm. do I have to do to get his blessing, mm -hmm. get him to bless me. See, that's all me, 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 me talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's alien. Yeah. It's alien talk. It shows that, that they really haven't seen God, mm -hmm. that they haven't really entered into. Amen. They can talk about the body all they want. But they're not, they're not really part of Christ. It's not just that we're part of one another. We're part of Christ. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes, this, this grace as an environment. See, God, what God is doing, he's taking the people, he's conforming them to the image of his son. But he's doing it in the room of grace. Grace is the work area. Yeah. That's the work area in which God is accomplishing mm -hmm. this work Amen. through his favor. So if you like you provoking God, the work stops. Yeah. I say it stops. Yes. That's it. Right. If you're walking as dear children, work accelerates. Because mm -hmm. that has to do with grace, see? Grace isn't overlooking. Grace isn't overlooking. Amen. Grace is looking. Right. Grace is looking and bestowing favor on the person because they've advantage, they've taken advantage of what God's offered. See? Like God is conquering grace. That's, That's right. Amen. So there's no blessing at all outside this environment of grace. No, not at all. So if, you, if a person is part of a system, religious system, that never mentions grace, then heart, there isn't very, there's very little of anything really God's doing in that environment because that's not the kind of environment he works in. So that that's why men default to law. 
because God isn't doing anything, so something's got to be done, so it looks like the only way it can be done is do it by law. That's why law, that's why, that's why men prefer law, is because nothing is being done in them, and they know it. So the attempt to make something happen by a sense of law. We're in. Grace, we're in. See, God is targeting a, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish. That's why it's by grace. That's why this can't be by works because that's too aggressive of a purpose for man to meet it on on his own. It's too, it's too aggressive. See, people target too, sh they shoot too short. Their goal isn't far enough. Some people's goal is, today I won't smoke. I'm telling you the truth now. And they think that this is a tremendous achievement if they manage to do that. Or some may graduate a little higher. They may say, today I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something good to somebody. Well, it isn't that bad, it's, that's, <laughs> that's not big enough. Yeah. You gotta look forward to the day of judgment and say, I wanna be found without blame then. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Now you see how you need grace. Yeah. Amen. Once you have that kind of a purpose. Mm -hmm. You don't stand in grace automatically or, <laughs> right. or while your mind or heart is focused in a different mm -hmm. direction. If you'll notice in those first eight verses, yeah. he's giving affirmation after yeah. affirmation. Yeah. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Grace mm -hmm. and peace to you from God the Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Yeah. And, and on and on he goes because this is a demonstration there you go. of what walking yeah. by faith and standing in grace is about. You're living in the awareness of the grace of God. Amen. 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 He and to have an awareness of these, this has to be talked about. Yes, that's right. This has to be proclaimed and expounded or pretty soon yes. people aren't thinking about yes. this. Right. And you just want to go ahead. With, with the purpose of God. What, what is salvation about? It's about making God known. Mm -hmm. So how is he going to be, I mean, the point of his working is so that it can be seen and be made yeah. manifest so that whenever it is seen, they see God. Yeah, so amen. To, to say, well, God is, God is working and and there was great grace, and then everybody keeps their mouth shut. <laughs> How is God glorified? Amen. Mm -hmm. You think you think that the angels look on, and do you think they're impressed because a man stopped drinking? Do you think this will actually impress a holy angel? And we're made a spectacle to angels. They will just say, "Well, he shouldn't been in the first place." Yes. Amen. This doesn't impress angelic personalities because a person manages not to do what he's been doing for a long time it may seem very significant to the individual I understand this and you may thank God for it but really this is not really progress progress is when you're more conformed to the image that's what progress is when you're more partaker of the divine nature these things do have to be done. Oh yeah. And so see that, but, but see to, to to end there or make that your your I've I ha, I haven't done all these, but this is just the beginning. Now it's in order that you can get gain access to That's this right. grace. Amen. If you live by grace, well, you're going to have to have the environment of grace to do that. Amen. God will work in it. And the Book of Ephesians. The objective of God is presented in a very thorough manner. We'll find as we plot through here, on an individual and collective basis, God's objective is that we all be united in the faith and grow up into Christ in all things. Yes, that's, no one in the history of the world has really managed to get that done, just in case you've wondered about it. It, and if it, if it was done to any degree, it didn't last long. 
But it, it's a very aggressive purpose. Purpose of God is to gather everything together into one, both in heaven mm -hmm. and there on earth. So it's not enough to have the unity here. It's got to be united with there too. <laughs> yeah. Unity's like a triangle, you know, with the point pointing upward. You got the two united on the horizontal, but the, all of them united on the vertical. Now let's be clear about about this. Any church program that does not blend perfectly with what God said he's targeting to do is not valid yes, amen. and it's not from God. Does it make any difference how highly it's talented, how much it sells, how popular it is? God's told us where he's going with his whole salvational purpose. He's told us where he's going. And if a program instituted by a church isn't going there, it should be dropped immediately. I think to me that's self-evident. There's no need to elaborate further on it. Grace, wherein? <laughs> Do you remember that this is the true grace of God, wherein you stand? And you'll remember that Paul and Barnabas admonished some devout Jews and proselytes, continue in the grace of God. Why? Because of this we're in. Because this we're in here. It's in grace, that's where all the needful things happen. Paul also commended the brethren to the progress and increase when they came to understand the grace of yes, God in truth. In truth, amen. Amen. So at all costs, we must remain in the perimeter of the grace of God. Not provoking God. Not being eliminated because of unbelief. See, you stay in that perimeter of grace. And it's a daily thing now. It's a daily, it's a moment by moment thing, actually. You, you focus on things above, not on things on the earth, see. You walk by faith, you live in the spirit and all these things. You keep, keep in that because God's not going to work his purpose outside that perimeter of grace. Amen. Brother Al one time in talking about standing in the grace of God looked at it from a chronological perspective. He said you can look at in the past and you can see the grace of God. That Jesus was full of grace and truth <laughs> when he came in his ministry in the earth. And he said and there is grace now. There's a throne of grace and things yeah. that grace presently does. And it says you can look forward to the grace that is he brought you at the revelation of Christ. So he mm -hmm. made this view of grace that no matter what perspective you take from a from a chronological perspective, grace is there to be seen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so when we say wherein, we mean within the confines of grace. That is where he has abounded toward us. In grace. <laughs> in that environment. Wherein he has abounded toward us. Some versions say, read, he made to abound toward us. He lavished upon us. He made to abound toward us. He gave us in full measure. He has caused to abound toward us. Notice that some of these versions use toward some in. Toward is the proper one. He shed on us abundantly. He showered down upon us, upon us the richness of his grace. Gave us that grace fully and freely. He gave to us in such large measure. He thought of everything, provided for everything, and lavished upon us. <laughs> It's obvious that s salvation does not have what we call sparsity or meager supplies. Mm -hmm. You'd never imagine it's looking at the average church. You'd never imagine that in Christ there's an abundance. Yeah. It's a surprise if somebody says something that's insightful. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Or do you, you haven't forgot, have you? He said, if anyone said anything that was in any way insightful, I could took you back. Mm -hmm. Mm 
or if anyone actually spoke to the glory of God. It was, it was most unique. <laughs> so this is a picture that modern church has not presented a proper picture of God. Is not presented a proper picture of Christ. God in Christ and by in, a, in grace has abounded. Some version says superabounded. Salvation is a marvelous for plenitude. And there's no law against any of what is what he's abounded in. There's no limit as to how much of it you can have at all. He's abounded. There's an endless supply. It, it never runs out. And even though you may get a lot of grace, the total amount of grace remains the same. It hasn't been depleted at all. Now, think how this was reflected in the language of Scripture. I've listed a few things here to show how abundance has been accented from Christ on. Life more abundantly. See, there it is. He poured out the Holy Spirit. Riches, the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering. See, the abundance. Receiving an abundance of grace. Grace did much more abound how shall he not with him also freely give us? See, oh, it's accident. Every, it's just accident. Every place is marvel. It's never overlooked. The riches of his glory, the riches both of his wisdom and knowledge. All things are yours. We possess all things, as possessing all things. The riches of his grace, the riches of the glory of the inher of his inheritance in the saints, rich in mercy, exceeding riches of his grace, unsearchable riches of Christ, <coughs> him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. His riches in glory, all riches of the full assurance of understanding, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Ye are complete in him. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. <laughs> the Holy Spirit which he has shed on us abundantly. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it with a wrath, rich in faith. See, it's, <laughs> it's accident over and over. It is, it's a marvel that this has been missed. Yeah. Amen. Why has it been missed? Because the wrong emphasis has been adopted. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's missed. Mm -hmm. It isn't missed because no one ever read these verses. Sometime, probably most Christians, at some time, whether, whether it was in a quarterly lesson or somewhere, they heard these verses. But when the, when the emphasis is pitched in the wrong direction, you never see this. You never see this aspect of salvation. I can tell you this personally. I had to get unplugged from the institution before these things became plain. Almost immediately, they became plain. It's just, it was like a, just like an inundation. <laughs> inundation of grace came upon me when finally I shook loose and we were free from the shackles of institutionalism. Now what I'm showing here is that in grace, God's abounded toward us. So if it looks like just a little trickle is coming so something's wrong with the vision there because this is not just a little trickle like a water fountain trickle. This is a bunch like a like a water gigantic waterfall with uh, all these rich all this richness being poured out. Now it doesn't say upon us. A lot of versions do read this upon us. It says toward us. And you might be interested to know that the original word here does mean toward. Does it mean in or upon? 
It's toward us. That's a technicality, but it's got to be realized. It's toward the saints. But you only have it if you lay hold of it by faith. That's why it's toward. That is, it's intended for them. But now the ball's in their court, so to speak. Their faith has to be awakened. They have to believe that this abundance is toward them or they can't, they can't partake of it. Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Great abundance, but yet there's nothing wasted. That's good. You only get what you tap into. That's yeah. good. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Branching off this, how big this is, is when you see it in Scripture, they don't, the Scripture doesn't exaggerate or anything. You see how it's to <laughs> the point and very factual. So when you see words like exceeding and abundant and richly, you know that this is something big that God's talking yeah. about. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's say for go ahead. About pressing on to lay hold or take hold. Yeah. Of that for which he was taken hold. Amen. Hold of. Amen. See, if it wasn't toward us, we couldn't take hold of it. This is intended. This plenitude is intended for the saints. It's, it's toward us. It's not toward angels. It's toward us. Us meaning those who are in Christ Jesus. Us meaning those who were who were chosen. <laughs> Us, meaning those who are predestinated to adoption. Yeah, that's, the, that's the us he's talking about. But if you don't hear about these things, you're not stretching, you don't stretch forward to apprehend them. And when you first hear about them, it almost seems a bit too good to be true. And you wonder, why, why didn't I see this before? Well, don't say, why didn't I see this before? Say, thank God I see it now. Amen. Judah. Lock in, in this area of this exceeding grace, we we have to be, we have to have perseverance, and we have to try to get them. We can't be lazy and get them. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's just like the manna. The manna was toward Israel. There wasn't anybody else traveling to the wilderness that got to eat that manna. Uh -huh. Let me tell you, uh -huh. it was exclusively. For the ones that were pilgriming through the desert, nobody else could eat that. That's the way this is. The grace is toward us, but you have to get up, go out, and gather it. And there's plenty there to be had by all. In fact, some who had commonly eaten it were cut off that's one point right. or another. That's right. Some were burned by fire. Some were bitten by snakes. Yeah. Some the ground opened up and swallowed them. Amen. Some died in plagues. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they ate the manna. That's right. Brother Gavin? Yes. I'm reminded by when Brother Jeremy said that you can't just sit down and wait for it to come to you. You have to go yeah. and retrieve it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Do you all ask in the word toward? That's right. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you you're on your side, you are to look. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. see? Look. But if it wasn't toward yeah. you, looking would be of no consequence, right? right? place, but if Adam and Eve didn't take their hand to <laughs> lay right. hold on the fruit, Amen. they wouldn't have had it. Amen. 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 It seems simple, but it, this answers a lot of questions that, that have arisen. The point is not where the abundance is found. That's not the point. The point is where it's directed. That's the point. It's directed to us who were chosen and loved and accepted and predestinated and <laughs> is toward them. Yeah, that's right. We say it's for them. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the point here is that any restriction of the abundance is not on God's side. Yeah. It's not that God didn't want to give it or didn't give it, or it's not on God's side. The restrictions are all on Earth's side. Amen. No limit to the mm -hmm. provision. There's only a limit to the participation. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yeah. These are the same ones that Christ has prepared, uh, like a habitation for God to be able to do this. Amen. Yeah. Now let's say that someone raised up a doctrine and said, "Yeah, but all these good things they were for the apostles. They weren't for us." Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that someone would have the audacity to say something like that. 
That doesn't fit in this text. But they were to say all the, all the powerful stuff, all the good stuff happened in the first century. But now things are just average now. That is toward us. As long as there's an us, mm -hmm. these supplies are toward them. Amen. Yeah. Oh, I glory in it. The word us assumes that, yeah. that all of this is taking place. There is, it assumes there is an us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a people toward whom all these things are focused. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know, say I don't know I'm one of the people. I don't have the full assurance of faith. I don't have the full assurance of understanding. I don't know whom I have believed. This doesn't mean much to me. But once this knowledge comes to you, that God is in me of a truth, that changes, that changes everything. Now when you look, you see this abundance. No one needs to come up short. Nobody. So we don't want anyone to ever give us an explanation for why they came up short. We're sorry that anybody does. We're sorry that any of us personally did come short. But that's not the thing to talk about. It's to recoup from that, mm -hmm. tap into the abundance. All this is toward us. He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, again, the various versions, they kind of they introduce confusion. Other versions read, he is abounded with all wisdom and, and understanding, or in all wisdom and insight, in all wisdom and intelligence, all wisdom and understanding, every kind of wisdom and insight. He understands us and knows and knows what is best for us at all times. The possessor of all wisdom and understanding. Along with, that is, he blesses us with all spiritual blessings, but the, well, along with wisdom and understanding, I mean, the people got the wisdom and understanding, is what those versions are saying. Through perfect wisdom and spiritual insight in every kind of wisdom and understanding practical insight and prudence well that's man's practical insight and prudence God we don't talk about God's insight as practical and as he thought of everything provided for everything we could possibly need all right now at this point <clears throat> The reader has to decide whether salvation is driven by human need or divine purpose. You have to decide between those two. Admittedly, it is presented quite often as human need. It's a pro providing for human need. Well, if that's the case, it has to be as God provides, as sees it. It can't be as man sees it. Even though it's consistently presented as what man sees as his need. Man doesn't see what his need is. That's what the, that's what the problem is. Yes, that's right. There's a vast difference between God pour, uh, having an abundance of grace toward us mm -hmm. to meet our need mm -hmm. or an abundance of grace toward us to fulfill his objective. There's a vast difference between the two. Yeah. Paul has gone to great lengths to point out point us in the right direction. He has spoken of spiritual blessings, being chosen in Christ, as those are both things God does, and being holy and without blame before him in love. There's the matter of having been predestinated to the adoption of sons and the driving factor of the good pleasure of his will. In the end, the saved are intended to be trophies and exhibits of his grace. He has abounded toward us with those things in mind, not with what you need in mind. In other words, God didn't consult with you 
before doing this. If it's seen properly, there's really not a conflict between what we need and what God is oh, yes. doing. Yeah. It's whenever men have have not made God central. If they have agendas outside of God, then they have all of these other things that they think they need mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with God or His purpose. Amen. When you see it properly, what we need is God. Amen. We're created in His image and for this purpose, our life. And who that's tasted that the Lord is good would go back to the weak and beggarly elements of the earth and say, no, no, this is what I need. Yeah. One thing is needful. Yeah, so it, it is it is need from God's perspective. Uh -huh. And when you have faith, it'll be from your perspective. You'll have God's perspective right. of the need. It ought to be obvious that the salvation of God placing, places the stress on what God is doing, not on what you are needing yeah. in the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that ought to be abundantly plain. But see, it isn't so abundantly plain. That's why he's teaching this in, in Ephesians 1. We must also determine if wisdom and prudence, if that's our, us having wisdom and prudence, or God had wisdom and prudence. We've got to determine which that is. I list the versions who's represented being are he abounded toward us, and we're the ones that got the wisdom and the prudence. Well, we don't deny that wisdom and prudence is conferred upon us, but you don't get that when you're born again. How do you know? Because Paul prayed that believers would have that. Yeah, right. yeah. See, yeah. there are some things you don't get it all when you're born again. You have to yeah. grow up yeah. into it, Amen. see? Amen. So I, I take it that this is speaking about God's Wisdom and prudence. Like we're not born with a mouthful of teeth. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's we're, not, right. we're not born with the ability to ride a bicycle. That's right. Amen. We're not born with the ability to walk or read. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, thing, to learn those things. There are things you get immediately, like remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, reconciliation. There are things you grow into, and you have them by measure. Yeah. You don't have forgiveness of sins by measure. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. some of your sins are forgiven and some aren't. Right. I mean, it's, that's a... All of them are forgiven. Heaven forgiven you all trespasses. See, so you got that when you come in. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about what you come, what you didn't get all wisdom and prudence when you came in. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have made a blunder if they, that was the case. So it's important to us to see this. Now this doesn't suggest that we're not in Christ if we don't have wisdom and prudence, of course. The point of the text is that God is abounded toward us in very wise and prudent ways. I want to illustrate this by making a few observations. What required wisdom and prudence? God has wisely and prudently abounded toward us in grace. Men speak of cheap grace. That's because they don't see this. He has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. See? Now, the character of God could not be compromised or ignored in the salvation of men. That's going to require some wisdom and prudence to work, work around this. The character of God, he hates pretentious religion. It's a state. I give you the scriptures where this is stated. There are some things that to him are an abomination. Mm -hmm. Things highly esteemed of men, abomination to him. Mm -hmm. Something had to be something had to be done with sin so that he no longer saw it. He was not going to stop hating it. Right. Well, it's going to require some wisdom and prudence now to get this done. See yeah. all they've 1,500 years of systematic, regimented sacrifices didn't alter the character of God towards sin one bit. He hated it just as much at the end of that as he did before. Amen. So if he's going to abound toward us, mm -hmm. 
He's got to work around this. He's got to work this out. Mm -hmm. The salvation cannot ask him to count on its sin or overlook sin or pretend like it's not there or not be affected by it. It's going to take wisdom and prudence. None of us could have figured out a way around this, I tell you. Again, God is fundamentally righteous. That's a trait that rises higher than men dare to imagine. In fact, his righteousness trumps his love. Mm -hmm. He can't do anything about his love till he's righteous to do so. Yeah. So it had to be right for God to save men. There could be no charge leveled against God said you, you did not do right mm -hmm. in saving sinful humanity. Mm -hmm. It had to be right. Yeah. He had to be just as well as a justifier. That takes wisdom and prudence to work that out. And third, there are angelic hosts and heavenly personalities watching on. Mm -hmm. These personalities saw Adam and Eve expelled from the garden for a comparatively small infraction. They saw the flood. They saw the dispersion at Babel. They saw the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So whatever it took to save men couldn't contradict or make those things appear wrong. Yeah. Could you say that that God's love is dictated by his righteousness in a manner of speaking? That he just because of his own character, yeah. he's not attracted to something yeah. that is not righteous. I think that's right, yeah, because God is love. That's right. Mm -hmm. That would be yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So here's these heavenly personalities. How are they going to do it? Is this salvation can't move them to think, well, why did God wipe the, uh -huh. the world out? Well, why did he disperse them at Babel and yet tolerate the division of the church? You see, it's all kind of questions introduced if, if this was not a righteous thing. And a way must be made for men to obtain the divine nature. God can't live with someone who's unlike himself. So now there has to be a way made, not just to overlook sin. The person has to be made like God. Amen. The only way that's possible is, is you're going to have to take the image of God and put it in a man. Mm -hmm. The man Christ Jesus, yes. in the fullness of the God he had dwelt bodily. And it, there has to be a way made for man to become like Christ. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this, this thing doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, of course, God in all wisdom and prudence, he worked that out. Transformation. <laughs> and sin had to be judged. Yeah. There isn't like a gigantic divine eraser just pretend, just erase it. Oh, <laughs> it's not like it had to be judged. Mm -hmm. How's it going to be judged? Well, think of the wisdom and prudence. First, you've got to get it all together at one place at one time. That, that itself is quite a, that's an impossibility with men. All the sin of the world had to be gathered together in one place, one time, put on one person, mm -hmm. and once and for all judged in that person. Yes, amen. That is a display of amen. wisdom and prudence, I'll tell you. It was legal. Mm -hmm. It was right. It stood in the courts of heaven. Not even the devil could contest it. Yes. It was thorough. The wisdom and prudence. All entered in by one man, yeah. so it was just that it all be taken away. That's by right, one man. amen. And a righteous, I'm showing now why there's wisdom and prudence. A righteous way of neutralizing the power of the devil had to be made that, and finally removing him from among the elect altogether. This had to be realized. You had to, while, while he completed the project, during this period of interim period of completion, the devil's power had to be neutralized. Now, he had he he was the god of the world. All the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them had been given to him. There had to be a way to neutralize his power, yet he still exists. He's still seeking to be made devour. But you've got to neutralize his power so his people can can resist the devil. How are you going to do that? That takes wisdom and prudence. You could not come up with a plan that would do this. That Satan moves about, 
but he's restricted. And he flees whenever anyone resists him. But God worked that out in his wisdom. Is that in this prudence and and wisdom that not one single soul has been lost Mm -hmm. by Christ, and no one who is undeserving has gotten in. Yes. Mm. Amen. Amen. You can see why wisdom and prudence is required. Salvation had to enable a person to live in a fallen world. While in a corrupt body and in the presence of moral wickedness, all the while working out his own salvation with fear and trembling. All right, now who could have come up with something but <laughs> to accomplish that other than God? In all wisdom and he did it. Amen. Salvation is so thorough you can walk in this wicked world, in Satan's territory, with Satan hounding you in a body of corruption, and still make it through. Yeah. Why? Yeah, he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Amen. That's how. So indeed, the wisdom and prudence were required, weren't they? Mm-hmm. And I thank God for it. Amen. I think I'll close there, but... Well, there's so much there. <laughs> so much there, I, got, I was kind of disappointed that I ran out of time. But uh, he had abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That's not a luxury. That's a necessity. Mm-hmm. He abounded. That's not a luxury. That's a necessity. <laughs> he did it in grace. That's not a luxury. That's a necessity. So see, grace was needed. We needed abundant supplies yes. to make it. That's so the environment of grace is created. Yes. Centering in Christ... See, it doesn't center in you. It centers the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It centers in him. And as we have mentioned before, he's going to give them some exhortations to do some things. That you're going to tell a person used to stealing, don't steal anymore. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just stop. Or that's not all, thief. Yeah. Labor with your hands, so now you become a giver. Amen. So you have to give to him that has needs. So now you're a giver. How's a person going to do that? An abundance of grace. <laughs> it conferred toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Mm-hmm. See, God's grace did that. Amen. All it took was for this to be announced, for the person to lay hold of it, say, I'm a man. Mm-hmm. I need grace. God has said it's available to me. I'm going to seek to find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. And you'll never... In all your life, you'll never come across an incident where grace isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Never will. Yeah. Any of you have something you'd like to say? Yeah, this thing, whole thing had to be worked out before the, even the first <laughs> man was, pre, was created. <laughs> no experiments. <laughs> and which, which proves that his wisdom and his prudence, it was with him in the beginning. Yeah. This, it worked this whole thing out, and not one thing has had to be changed. That's right. Nothing. No Amen. update. <laughs> Yes, with Ricky. Wisdom is an excellent manager of things. Oh, yes. Everything that is introduced into the work has to fit in, has to work to the end God has determined. Amen. Whether it's men or angels or grace or righteousness, it all has to conform to this one eternal purpose that's in Christ Jesus. And uh, I think since we've gone through this tabernacle, Brother Mike was the one that really brought this out, how all these rough materials <laughs> had to be refined yeah. because everything has to be brought together so it fits together in the end. Amen. And that requires an abundance of wisdom. The more you give man, the less they're able to manage. Amen. That's the way it is. But God can take all things and make them all work together for good. Amen. You notice that under a law system, men ask how? How do I do it? How do I do it? But faith wants to know, why is this such a great salvation? That's what, what he's expounding. He's expounding the why of it, see? He's saying this on a solid basis. You can, you can build on this. You can't build on what you should do. But you can build on this that we've been talking about. And we're all at verse 8. Go ahead. You have here, all the while working out their own salvation with fear and trembling, has to do with the 
fiery trial of faith. That's right. That's now it's necessary that our proving and the refining of our faith. That's this right. is the way God is working out. So now He's provided for us in, in the context that He's provided grace mm -hmm. to get us through. Amen. The refining process, the proving, Amen. The proving ground. Amen. Cannot cheat grace <laughs> or, or wrongfully take advantage of grace. They exploit it, yeah. A person <clears throat> cannot continue in sin so that grace may abound. Mm -hmm. it just, it's impossible to do uh -huh. because That's he's right. abounded it to us in wisdom and prudence. Amen. Mm -hmm. Grace has a utility, and so you can't, you can't use it for anything you want to use. That's it. right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Plus, it's unique. towards us. Right. Yeah. Yes. Not towards them. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you try and exploit grace or use it for personal advantage, it doesn't it won't work for you. Exclusive means is for salvation. Amen. Grace. Mm -hmm. When you think of it as an environment, it's the only environment that the divine supplies are in. When you get in any other environment, they aren't there. Mm -hmm. So you see the wisdom of, of it being by faith through grace. Yeah. Because both faith and grace are exclusive. Faith yeah. being the only faculty of uh, apprehending from God anything that is favorable or beneficial, and grace the only provision of favor and power from God. Amen. Very so good. That, and that, that it, it really protects both because those that do not have faith Godward, grace is inaccessible to. Yeah. So that in itself cuts off the, the uh, attempts that Perhaps somebody might try to make uh, to to use grace in an unlawful manner. It can't even be done because faith will dictate. Real faith will dictate how uh, you know what what a person is apprehending from God, what they're seeking after. Amen. And that's the sort of thing grace provides. Mm hmm And then grace. Uh, uh, God it has all power, but all of God's power would not be beneficial to us in the, as we are now. So grace is, I remember uh, Brother Fred said that faith was perfectly adapted to yeah. our condition. Mm -hmm. Well, so is grace, because yeah. it's the kind of power that we need in order to succeed in, in what God is doing in us. Amen. It's not that condemning, frowning, destroying power that, that some people are going to know. It's the power of God toward us to accomplish in us all His good pleasure. Amen. Power That's unto right. salvation. It's the right. same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's right. It is Amen. Power. It is It is It is, it is power. You know, it's like we, we bring electricity in our house. If we ask for just electricity and we got sent a bolt of lightning, this is not what we would need. That's right. It would consume us. It would hurt us. It would tear things up. But, but whenever it's converted to a form that does the work that we need done, and it doesn't hurt us, we can walk past all these wires all day long. We're not hurt by them. Mm -hmm. It works for us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's what faith does. It it safely apprehends this power, and this power is adapted to to what our what we require in mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. to to be changed and conformed and and to overcome. And it's real power. Amen. Grace is a safe conductor of God's power. Yeah. Safe conductor. That's right. Amen. Yeah. That's good. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the magnitude of salvation, the plenteousness of it. You're plenteous, you said, in mercy. You know how salvation expounds that to us. We're grateful, Father, for the abundance that You have given us in Christ Jesus and pray that You'd help our faith to grow so we could apprehend more of it. In Jesus' name, amen.